The Metal Gear Solid franchise features one of the most extensive and elaborate timelines in all of gaming. Konami's epic espionage series unfurls its dense narrative across 11 games with an alternate history timeline that spans from the height of the Cold War in the 1960s through to a neo-futuristic take on the 21st century. It's big, it's bold, and it is absolutely, unequivocally, undeniably bonkers. And we wouldn't have it any other way. But how exactly does it all tie together? Well, the short answer is, it's messy. The long answer, however, well, that's going to take some time to fully explain. To make matters even more complicated, there are a fair few games that aren't considered canon, including Metal Gear Acid and Snake's Revenge. And well, the less said about Metal Gear Survive, the better. So don't expect that nonsense on this timeline. Regardless, this is going to be a long and detailed timeline, so strap yourselves in. My name's Adam, and this is the complete Metal Gear Solid timeline fully explained. Alright, Metal Gear's epic narrative kicks off in the height of the Cold War, right in the aftermath of the Cuban Missile Crisis, which takes on something of a slightly different context within the universe of Snake Eater. After the US successfully rescues a defected Soviet rocket scientist by the name of Nikolai Stepanovich Sokolov, the Russians retaliate by setting up a nuclear camp on the island of Cuba. And much like the real-world chain of events, the Soviet Union eventually agrees to remove their nuclear presence in an exchange of sorts. You see, the Soviets want dear old Sokolov back because of a little something known as Project Shagahod, a tank-like vehicle armed to the teeth with nuclear weaponry, which could be primed to strike anywhere in the world. And this is the context with which we first drop into the world of Metal Gear Solid. Fast forward two years to 1964, and we hit the main events of the first chronological game in the franchise, Snake Eater. The US has greenlit a mission to extract Sokolov once again before he can complete his work on Shagahod. To this end, they instruct Major Zero to lead a mission behind enemy lines, and he sets up a new CIA unit known as Fox to complete what they dub the Virtuous Mission. On the team are paramedic, no guesses for what role they fill, a veteran soldier simply known as the boss, more on her in a little bit, and the player character of Jack, a former pupil of the boss, who goes by the slightly awkward codename Naked Snake. Snake infiltrates behind Soviet lines and without much in the way of hassle at all, is able to secure Sokolov. But here's the rub, he's not the only one after the in-demand scientist. You see, the pair are soon ambushed by a baby-faced Major Ocelot, a fella who will be cropping up in a fair whack of this timeline. Ocelot and his troops attempt to take Sokolov by force, but they're as effective as a light breeze against Snake's CQC skills, and the pair escape without harm. They don't escape from their next ambush though, which for Snake at least comes completely out of left field. The boss suddenly appears, and instead of helping Snake complete his mission, she reveals that she has defected to their Soviet counterparts, and is taking Sokolov with her. Her comrades actually turn out to be the military intelligence agency GRU, who are attempting to seize power in the Soviet Union for themselves, and they want Sokolov and his Shagahod in order to do this. This treasonous little band is led by a lad called Volgin, who has also recruited the legendary Cobra unit, a band of superpowered troops that were led by the boss back in World War II. Anyway, the boss makes off with Sokolov and a pair of massive rockets called, um, Davy Crockett's, and the so-called virtuous mission ends with Snake left for dead, and Volgan using one of the Davy Crockett's to blow a nuclear hole in the middle of the Russian wilderness. Ouch. And that's just the first hour of the game. We've only just got to the not a Bond song title credits. Okay, so US-Soviet relations are obviously quite strained at this point, with a small matter of a nuclear bomb detonating on Russian soil exacerbating the situation. The Soviet President Khrushchev calls his US counterpart, President Johnson, to tell him as much, and a little more. And by a little more, I mean threatening nuclear war with America. They come to a little deal to get around this squabbling, whereby the US government has to effectively prove that they didn't have anything to do with the nuclear detonation. This amounts to another mission into the Russian jungle to eliminate Volgin and the boss, recover the remaining Davy Crockett, and rescue Sokolov once again. Does this mission have a cool sounding codename? You bet your hat it does. Operation Snake Eater. So Snake crash lands back into the Soviet Union once again and makes his way to meet up with his contact on the ground, a lad called Adam, who is a defected American spy, which I guess technically makes him a double agent? Anyway, Adam is a no-show and Snake instead rendezvous with his counterpart, Eva, in a sequence that has not aged well at all. You know what I'm talking about. 
Anyway, Eva and Snake fight off another attack from the Ocelot unit before Snake systematically kills off every last member of Cobra unit on his way to rescuing Sokolov. En route, he bumps into a scientist known as Granin, who's somewhat disillusioned as his own bipedal tank project has been thrown by the wayside in favour of Sokolov's Shagohod. Don't worry lad, I have a feeling that that project will have quite the legacy in this franchise. Granin directs Snake to the Shagohod, but he's captured on the way by Volgin, who then beats poor Sokolov to death and tortures Snake to within an inch of his life, a process that sees him lose an eye. Despite his injuries, Snake manages to escape with the help of Eva and makes a beeline for the Shagohod to destroy the late Sokolov's project. Volgin intervenes and, well, this is where the plot thickens. You see, Volgin lets Snake in on a little secret and tells him all about an organisation known as the Philosophers, which is essentially a bunch of rich lads from the US, China and the Soviet Union. Long story short, they masterminded victory over the Nazis during World War II before amassing a fortune in cash known as the Philosophers' Legacy. Unsurprisingly, all that money drove them a little bit mad, and the legacy was broken up, with some of it finding its way into Volgin's hands. This is all just a prelude to a great big bloody fight between Snake and Volgin though, which ends with the latter being killed supposedly by, of all things, a bolt of lightning. But we are not done yet, there are at least three double crosses left in this twisty tale of espionage. Next on Snake's hit list is the boss, and while he's hesitant to pull the trigger, he eventually does so. But not before she's able to give him an all-important microfilm of critical info on the legacy, a microfilm which is then stolen by Eva after a night together with Snake. You see, Eva reveals her true colours as a spy working for the Chinese, who want the legacy for themselves. But twist within a twist, she also reveals that the boss was actually ordered to defect to Volgin by the Americans to secure the legacy as well. And it's this twist that hits the hardest, as it means that the boss effectively sacrificed herself as a US traitor to help prove America's innocence. Okay, we are nearly done with the Snake Eater, but finally let's tie up some loose ends. Firstly, for a job well done, Snake is granted the title of Big Boss, but he ultimately ends up demoralised for his part in Operation Snake Eater and he quits Fox Unit. And then there's the curious case of Ocelot, who it turns out is actually a triple agent. While he was masquerading around as part of the GRU, he was actually operating as a double agent for their rivals, the KGB. But he was actually, actually, really working for the CIA as the defected spy Adam, in an attempt to secure the philosopher's legacy, which he does. Well, half of it at least. The other half he keeps for himself along with Granin's bipedal tank plans, which goes by the name of Metal Gear by the way, but we'll get to that in due time. Okay, next up we fast forward six years to the San Geronimo Crisis that makes up the action of Metal Gear Solid Portable Ops. Snake's old team Fox Unit has gone rogue and are now led by a wildly charismatic commander called Gene. I say wildly charismatic as he's literally been artificially created to be the perfect commander as a result of the successor project, a scheme designed to produce soldiers in the image of the boss. He's aided by Lieutenant Cunningham as well as a woman called Elisa who has significant psychic abilities and a split personality known as Ursula. Elisa and Ursula are pretty black and white in their allegiances. Elisa is on Snake's side while Ursula bats for Fox. Anyway, the game kicks off at Jean's base of operations on the San Geronimo Peninsula with poor old Snake once again being tortured, this time at the hands of Lieutenant Cunningham, who's trying to ascertain the location of the missing half of the Philosopher's Legacy. As we've established, Snake hasn't got a Scooby, and he's chucked back into his cell where he gets chatting to a Green Beret called Roy Campbell. Anyway, the pair escape, otherwise there wouldn't be a game, and Snake attempts to make contact with his old CO, Major Zero, but instead reaches his old teammates Paramedic and Sigint, who aided him on Operation Snake Eater. They detail to Snake that he's now seen as a traitor to the US, and that the only way he can clear his name is if he takes down Gene's Fox Unit Rebellion and destroys the prototype Metal Gear tank. And so Snake's mission to take down Gene basically makes up for the rest of the narrative of Portable Ops, but this is a Metal Gear Solid game and nothing's really that simple. You see, as Snake undertakes his mission, he discovers a fair few revelations along the way. Firstly, Lieutenant Cunningham is actually a double agent working for the Pentagon, in an attempt to undermine the CIA and gain the upper hand as the leading security agency in the US. He reveals this to Snake while detailing that his plan is to push Gene into launching a nuke at the Soviet Union in an attempt to prolong the Cold War. Secondly, the good Dr. Sokolov isn't dead. Yeah, somehow he survived his ordeal in the Soviet Union and is now masquerading as a character known as Ghost, who offers intel on the Metal Gears to Snake. 
Thirdly, and perhaps most importantly, Snake learns of Jean's ultimate plan, a plan to launch a nuke on the US to destroy the Philosophers in a bid to create his own nation of soldiers known as Army's Heaven. Naturally, this plan doesn't come to fruition as Snake kills Jean, but with his dying breath, Jean hands over all his funds and info on Army 7 to Snake. Oh, and I can't forget Elisa and her psychic abilities. In the wake of aiding Snake, she's murdered by Jean, but she also has critical info to hand over during her dying moments. She foretells that the children of the big boss, who she calls Les Enfants Terribles, will come to destroy and save the world, which are both events that we will eventually get to. In the meantime, we catch back up with Ocelot, who is now a quadruple agent, I guess, as he murders his old boss, the director of Central Intelligence, before stealing the remaining half of the Philosopher's Legacy. And in a cheeky post credit sting during a conversation with Major Zero, the pair hatch a plan to use the Legacy to kickstart a new project known as Cypher, a project that Ocelot agrees to on one condition, that Big Boss joins the team too. Right, before we barrel on into the next entry on the franchise, there's a few important details to set up, like, you know, the birth slash creation of Solid Snake and his evil twin Liquid. So, Cypher begins in earnest in the wake of the events of Portable Ops, and Major Zero starts to build a team and an ideal around creating a united world. Zero builds this ideology around Big Boss's mythic status as the perfect soldier, and so he becomes the symbol of sorts for Cypher. Only as time goes on, Big Boss starts to drift from this ideal, and he starts to become more and more wary of Major Zero's leadership. Terrified of losing his perfect mascot, Zero authorises a project known as Les Enfants Terribles, which uses Big Boss's DNA to create a pair of clones known as Eli and David, or to call them by their more popular codenames, Liquid Snake and Solid Snake. The twins are separated, with Solid staying in the US and Liquid growing up in the UK, before he escapes to Africa to get away from Cypher. But beyond that, a third clone was created at a later date, and this strapping young creation was called Solidus Snake, and he constituted the perfect recreation of Big Boss's DNA. Speaking of Big Boss, he isn't best pleased when he discovers the Les Enfants project, and this prompts him to hand in his notice, so to speak, to Cypher and go freelance. And by freelance, I mean set up his own rival group, known as the Militaire Sans Frontières, or MSF, an organisation that plays a key role in the next game on the timeline. Right, it's four years on since the events of Portable Ops, and we find ourselves in 1974 for Metal Gear Solid Peace Walker. With Big Boss now heading up the MSF as a small mercenary outfit, they get a bit of business coming their way from a university professor called Ramon Galvez Mina and one of his students known as Paz. The pair are keen to hire the MSF to look into a military faction that has started causing havoc across Costa Rica. Big Boss refuses at first, believing Ramon to be a KGB spy, but he's quickly won over by a recent voice recording they play him that supposedly proves that his mentor, the boss, is still alive. Despite the fact that he, um, killed her over a decade ago. The tantalising mystery of the boss's potential resurrection spurs Big Boss into action and he gets on the case. Boss hightails it to Costa Rica and immediately sniffs out the marauding army, which leads him right onto the tracks of one of Peace Walker's big bads, a lad that goes by the ridiculous name of Hot Cold Man. Alongside Hot Cold Man, Big Boss discovers a project code named Peace Walker, which is basically a giant four-legged nuclear launch system. Big Boss does some good old-fashioned infiltrating and he encounters Huey Emmerich, one of the Peace Walker's designers who eventually agrees to help him and handily points him in the direction of one Doctor Strangelove. Not that one. Big Boss finds Strangelove and discovers that the AI system behind the Peace Walker has been modelled on his old mentor, the Boss, hence the mysterious new recording that freaked him out in the game's beginning. Big Boss chases the Peace Walker across the border and into Nicaragua, where he finally confronts Hot Coldman, and it turns out that Coldman has created Peace Walker to guarantee the US's nuclear retaliation, as an impartial launch system devoid of human intervention. He also plans to fire off a nuke to prove this theory. And it's this drastic moment that the facility is overrun by Soviet soldiers, who are led by Ramon Galvez, who, shock twist, turns out to be Vladimir Zadornov. Zadornov wants the Peace Walker for himself, and he makes a move to seize it, only for a second intervention in the form of the MSF, who tear into the building. Big Boss is able to leverage the chaos to his advantage, and he moves to destroy the Peace Walker, but not to the extent that it can't fire its nuclear payloads. And while Coldman is near death from wounds received in the battle, he's able to activate a launch uplink, which convinces the US government that they're about to face a nuclear strike from the Soviet Union. 
cue a lot of frantic and tense conversations where Big Boss tries to convince the US military's Big Brass that it's all just a ploy to get them to retaliate and kickstart a nuclear war. But all of this is a moot point anyway, as the Peace Walker's damaged AI is overrun by the boss's personality, which sinks the four-legged behemoth in a nearby lake, nullifying the threat completely. Phew, that was the definition of a close call. But as this is a Metal Gear game, there's one more twist in this tale, and that's the true intentions behind Zadornov's supposed student Paz. You see, with all said and done, Zadornov is imprisoned back at the MSF base in the Caribbean Sea. During an attempted breakout from Zadornov, Big Boss tries to intercept him and ends up shooting the Russian spy. But this is all just a prelude to the main event, which kicks off when Paz seizes the controls of another Metal Gear, which is known as Zeke. You see, it turns out that Paz is actually an agent for Cypher, and on the orders of Major Zero has come to present an ultimatum to Big Boss, relinquish control of the MSF to Cypher, or see the organisation branded as terrorists. She backs up this ultimatum with the threat of a nuclear launch on the eastern seaboard, which will see the MSF singled out as the perpetrators. None of this comes to pass though, as Big Boss does Big Boss things and takes down Metal Gear Zeke, which also throws Paz out of the cockpit and into the sea. Okay, before we head on into the madness that is Metal Gear Solid 5, we need to talk about a lad called Skullface, who will have quite the impact across the next few entries in this timeline. So, Skullface has actually been knocking about for a while by this point, but to keep things ticking I thought it best to compile his own little timeline here. You see, Skullface has been operating in the background right since the very beginning, during the events of Snake Eater. As the commander of the covert CIA team XOF unit, or Zoff, Skullface was working behind the scenes to offer support for the Virtuous and Snake Eater missions. After the Fox unit was officially disbanded, Major Zero offered Skullface a role with Cypher, which saw him lead Zero's personal strike force. But as the years went on, Skullface grew a deep hatred for Zero, as well as his perfect soldier Big Boss, and this led him to seek out opportunities to strike back against them, all of which leads us to... Next up on the timeline is Metal Gear Solid V Ground Zeroes, which takes place in 1975, just a few short months after the events of Peace Walker. Skullface has fully gone off the rails and he and his Zoff forces have taken control of an American prison base in Cuba called Camp Omega. Tensions are naturally high between Skullface and his rivals at Cypher and the big boss run MSF, and this leads to Zoff kidnapping the presumed dead Cypher agent Paz, who had survived her ordeal at the end of Peace Walker. To complicate matters, another MSF agent and ally, the former child soldier Chico, has been captured by Zoff during his attempts to rescue Paz. Big Boss and his MSF co-founder and ally Kazuhiro Miller decide to hatch an exfiltration of both of them, in fear that either Paz or Chico could release information that could compromise the MSF. Cue a classic Big Boss infiltration of Camp Amiga. Long story short, Big Boss rescues both Chico and Paz, and the trio escape in an MSF helicopter. Only en route back to the MSF mother base, they discover that a bomb has been planted in Paz's stomach, prompting an MSF medic to perform a mad ad hoc operation to remove it right there on the helicopter. Only it's out of the frying pan and into the fire for Boss and the chopper, as when they arrive back at mother base it's under attack from Zoff forces. Boss and the Chopper crew are able to land and rescue a handful of MSF staff members, along with Kaz Miller, but as they escape the crumbling base, another wrench is thrown into the works in the form of another bomb inside Paz. Paz sacrifices herself and jumps out of the helicopter just as the bomb explodes, which causes the Chopper to crash into a Zoff helicopter that's in pursuit. The resulting collision sees Big Boss, Kaz Miller and the MSF medic severely injured, but they survive the ordeal and are rescued and rushed to a hospital in Cuba, where Boss and the medic slip into deep comas. And so we come up to the biggest gap in this timeline so far, a nine year hiatus that leads up to the events of the Phantom Pain. Okay, so Big Boss finally awakens from his coma in 1984 to a very different world to the one he left in 1975. For starters, there has been a good deal of skullduggery behind the scenes on behalf of the franchise's new big bad, Skullface. Not only has he been conducting dubious research into a slew of nasty parasites that give their host superhuman abilities, one of which he uses to send Major Zero into a crippling vegetative state, but he has also created a giant new Metal Gear-like behemoth called Silanthropus. In short, he's been busy. 
Anyway, back to Big Boss, who wakes up from his coma in a British military hospital in Cyprus. He has to spring to action immediately to foil an assassination attempt on his life from a mute cipher killer called Quiet, all before he's rescued by a heavily bandaged man called Ishmael. Don't forget Ishmael, he's very important. Boss escapes the hospital by the skin of his teeth, and that's no tall order, seeing as he's up against two of Skullface's superhumans, the third child, who will grow up to be iconic Metal Gear Solid villain Psycho Mantis, and the Man on Fire, the revived form of Snake Eater's big bad Volgin, whose sheer hatred for Big Boss has manifested itself as, well, a man on fire. Anyway, forget about villains old and new for now, as Boss is recovered from the hospital by his old frenemy Revolver Ocelot, who fills him in about the hot new mercenary group on the scene, the Diamond Dogs, which is led by Boss's old acquaintance Kaz Miller. Big Boss takes on a brand new codename of Venom Snake and sets about his new mission of unearthing the whereabouts of Cypher, the outfit he believes responsible for his attempted assassination. This new campaign takes him to the war-torn deserts of Afghanistan and Angola, as Snake recruits friends and enemies both old and new, including Dr. Huey Emmerich, his accomplice from Peace Walker, and Quiet, the mute assassin that tried to kill him. On top of this, he also recruits Code Talker, who's an expert on the parasitic infections causing all the weird superheroics, because, well, he worked on them for Cypher. Lastly, he also captures a young lad known as the White Mamba, who turns out to be a British kid called Eli, who, if you can remember back to the Les Enfants Terribles section of this timeline, is actually one of the clones of Big Boss. A DNA test mysteriously doesn't confirm this, but more on that later. Anyway, with his ragtag team of diamond dogs, Snake Slash Boss discovers the truth behind Cypher, which is that Zero is no longer the big brass anymore, and that Skullface and his renegade Zoth fighters are now very much in charge. As I've already mentioned, they've been busy in the years since Snake Slash Boss last encountered them, working on a parasite strain that will kill anyone who speaks English. He couples this parasite with the threat of the giant Salanthropus and uses this heady cocktail to enact his dastardly plans. This all backfires though when one of his lackeys, the third child, betrays him, and uses his psychic powers to drive the giant mech to attack him, which mortally wounds old Skullface. While Snake and Kaz, who are also on the scene, decline to put Skullface out of his misery, he's instead executed by Dr. Huey Emmerich. Okay, we are starting to reach the endgame of the Phantom Pain, but there is a lot of endgame in the Phantom Pain. For starters, the Salanthropus, along with the third child, are brought back to the Diamond Dogs base in the Seychelles, and that instigates a rebellion from Eli and the other rescued child soldiers at the base. Eli and the third child share a psychic connection of sorts, and they all escape the base with the giant mech. Anyway, that's the least of Snake's problems, as an epidemic of the vocal cord parasite has spread through the base too, forcing Snake to kill a good deal of his own soldiers. All fingers point to Huey as the source of the epidemic, and he's accused of experimenting on the parasites for use as bioweapons, and Snake banishes him from the Diamond Dogs. And on top of all of that, Quiet has gone rogue too, and it turns out that's because she's also infected with the parasite. The reason why she doesn't speak is purely so she doesn't spread the infection, but she speaks up to save Snake in the end and flees as a result, never to be seen again. And despite all of that, the biggest reveal of all comes in the form of the real identity of Venom Snake, who, shock twist, isn't actually Big Boss after all. Oh no, instead he's the MSF medic that went into a coma at the same time as Big Boss at the end of Ground Zeroes. You see, it turns out that Major Zero had one more mission to fulfil and that was to ensure the safety of Big Boss, and he pulled all the strings to perform the switcheroo. And so after a good deal of plastic surgery and hypnotherapy, the medic became a doppelganger of Big Boss to wage war and cipher, while the real Big Boss, who was actually the bandaged saviour Ishmael, told you he was important, went about creating his dream of a rogue military state out of heaven. Yeah, a lot happens in the Phantom Pain. Okay, with two big bosses knocking about in a post-Phantom Pain world, things start to get a little confusing. And that's even before the introduction of Big Boss's clone son, the iconic protagonist Solid Snake. The year is 1995, and a lot has happened in the years preceding Phantom Pain. For starters, the real Big Boss has succeeded in creating Outer Heaven, which is now located in South Africa. He has also come out of his long exile to rejoin the US military, in a bid to set up a cover story for his nefarious operation. To this end, he hires an old pal called Frank Yeager, who's given the code name Grey Fox, and the pair re-establish the Foxhound command unit. All of this is because of the rising threat of Cypher, who are now going by the snazzy new name of the Patriots. 
Anyway, without a heaven also proving to be quite the threat to the world's health, the CIA instructs Foxhound to investigate the compound and see if the rumours of weapons of mass destruction are actually true. Naturally, all of this takes place without the CIA knowing that it's their very own big boss responsible for the whole damn thing. Grey Fox is dispatched to investigate, but he's immediately captured and imprisoned, all of which sets the scene for our new hero in the franchise, Solid Snake. Okay, so Solid Snake is but a mere rookie in the ranks of Foxhound at this stage, completely unaware of his origins as a clone from the Les Enfants Initiative. But like father like son, he successfully infiltrates Outer Heaven, rescues Grey Fox and discovers that the base is in control of a new Metal Gear project. Long story short, Snake destroys the new nuclear tank and makes to escape, but is confronted by Big Boss himself, or more accurately, his phantom Venom Snake, who reveals the truth behind Outer Heaven's intentions. Yet more importantly, he reveals that Big Boss is Solid Snake's biological father, before detailing the mad origins of the cloning program. All of these big revelations lead to a great big bloody fight to the death, and against all odds, Solid is able to defeat Venom Snake and foil the real Big Boss's plan. It's not a happy ending for Solid though, as despite returning to the US as a hero, he leaves Foxhound feeling betrayed by Big Boss's web of lies. Solid Snake's retirement from Foxhound lasts exactly four years though, as he's prompted back into action for Metal Gear 2 Solid Snake. The year is 1999, the Cold War is still raging, and the world is fighting over oil. In the wake of this oil crisis, a leading scientist called Dr. Keo Marv engineers a solution to the world's problems, with an alternative fuel source called Oilix. Only en route to his demonstration of Oilix, the good doctor is kidnapped by terrorist forces from a newly established military state known as Zanzibarland. You have exactly one guess for who's behind this new rogue nation. Yep, Big Boss. Without a heaven ending is an embarrassing failure, Boss is giving his dream a second try, and he aims to hold the world ransom by monopolising the world's oil supply. And this is the reason why Solid Snake is coaxed out of retirement to infiltrate Zanzibarland. The infiltration doesn't exactly go smoothly though, and Solid eventually runs into his old pal Grey Fox, who's still working for Big Boss. Armed with a new Metal Gear, Solid destroys the new mech and kills his old colleague once and for all. And when I say once and for all, I am definitely fibbing, as this is not the last we see of Grey Fox, but that's a story for a little later. And Metal Gear 2 all comes to a head with another confrontation with Big Boss, the real one this time. Snake, with absolutely no weapons left, has to improvise a flamethrower from a lighter and an aerosol can, and using this makeshift weapon, he kills Big Boss as well. And just like that, the enigmatic Big Boss, a mainstay in this franchise since the very chronological beginning, is dead and gone. Also a fib, let me explain. You see, the Shady Patriots, still very much operating in the background, recover both the bodies of Big Boss and Grey Fox, and start experimenting on them. They're able to reanimate the corpse of Grey Fox, and they attach an exoskeleton to this monstrosity to create Cyborg Ninja. Big Boss, meanwhile, is put into a form of cryostasis, allowing the Patriots leader, our old friend Zero, and his team to immortalise him as the symbol he always wanted for his organisation. Right, before we barrel on into perhaps the most iconic entry in the franchise, it's time to reacquaint ourselves with some clones. You see, our old mates Liquid and Solidus have been busy in the years since we last caught up with them. And by busy, I mean setting up a terrorist splinter unit of Foxhound and threatening the world with nuclear devastation, and becoming the President of the United States respectively. You know, just normal, everyday busyness. Anyway, the pair of them effectively orchestrate the events of Metal Gear Solid, which goes by the name of the Shadow Moses Incident. Liquid and his aforementioned Foxhound splinter group ambush the Shadow Moses compound, take a pair of high-ranking hostages, and threaten the White House with nuclear devastation, all in a bed to regain the corpse of Big Boss, which is still in the possession of the Patriots. Liquid's ultimate game plan here is to use Big Boss's DNA to further perfect his band of genome soldiers, many of which we'll meet across this section of the video. President Solidus is himself a secret patriot, but not an all too happy patriot, and in a bid to get back at them, has actually masterminded the whole enterprise via Revolver Ocelot, with the end game of hijacking a new Metal Gear known as Rex, but I'm very much getting ahead of myself. Back to the beginning of Metal Gear Solid and the return of Solid Snake, who's coaxed out of retirement once again and must be feeling sick of all this espionage nonsense by now. Luckily he's not, and we have the rollicking madcap story of the original Metal Gear Solid. 
He promptly infiltrates the Shadow Moses complex and quickly recovers the first hostage, the DARPA chief Donald Anderson. Anderson reveals that the Metal Gear Rex has been deactivated, and then he, out of nowhere, promptly dies of a heart attack. Take note of this, as it'll prove to be important in about a minute's time. Anyway, en route to locating the next hostage, Snake is confronted by franchise stalwart Revolver Ocelot, prompting a boss fight that comes to a premature end when Ocelot's hand is cut off by a rampaging cyborg ninja. In the wake of this bizarre encounter, Snake rescues the next hostage, the arms tech president Kenneth Baker, who briefs Snake on how to stop the Metal Gear Rex before, yep, carking it from a heart attack. While Snake's success ratio for hostage rescuing is a stone cold 0%, he soldiers on regardless. On his way to taking down Liquid, who he still doesn't know is his twin, he encounters the so-called Sons of Big Boss, a team of genetically engineered super soldiers all sporting snazzy animal-related names. First up, there's Vulcan Raven, who attacks Snake with a giant cannon, then there's Psycho Mantis, who the player memorably defeats by switching their controller to the player 2 slot, then there's Sniper Wolf, who hunts Snake across a few memorable sequences, and finally Decoy Octopus, who it turns out was in disguise as Donald Anderson earlier on in the game and died. Anyway, Snake systematically fights and defeats all of them en route to Liquid Snake and a big confrontation atop the Metal Gear Rex. And it's here where Snake discovers the big reveal about his brotherly relationship with Liquid via the Les Enfants program. You see, Liquid has something of a complex when it comes to his brother, making him bitter due to his belief that Solid has the superior genes to him. His desire to gain Big Boss's corpse stems from his desire to achieve a genetic purity close to his late father, but it turns out he's dead wrong on all of this, as we later find out that Liquid actually has the superior genes to Solid, but they're both inferior to the perfect clone that is Solidus. Gosh, my head hurts. But that's not the only revelation from Liquid, as he reveals to Snake that he's been infected with a virus known as Fox Dye, which will infect and kill members of the Foxhound team when he comes into contact with them. Oh, and one last revelation, Cyborg Ninja reveals himself as the reanimated corpse of Grey Fox, all before being crushed by the Metal Gear Rex. All this madness comes to a head with Snake defeating Liquid, first in the Metal Gear Rex, then via the Fox Dive virus during an audacious escape in a jeep. The fallout from Metal Gear Solid, which I guess is the wrong choice of word seeing as it's all about averting nuclear destruction, is the death of Liquid and all his Foxhound team, the death of Grey Fox slash Cyborg Ninja, and well, I guess we can chuck the dismemberment of Revolver Ocelot in there too for good measure. On the Ocelot front, he's actually successful in his mission to get the Metal Gear Rex data back to Solid as Snake. Only Ocelot does Ocelot things, and sells the data on the black market, which prompts the Patriots to suss out Solidus's plans and go after him, pushing the perfect clone to become openly antagonistic to the organisation. Solid Snake, meanwhile, is declared dead, which largely allows him to live his life however he chooses, so at least that's something of a happy ending. Right, next up on the timeline we head straight into Metal Gear Solid 2 Sons of Liberty, which takes place in both 2007 and 2009. The 2007 section, which effectively acts as the prologue of the game, sees Solid Snake infiltrating an oil tanker that's been scuttled in the middle of the Hudson River, and supposedly contains a new model of Metal Gear known as the Ray. Solid boards the tanker, which is absolutely swarming with Russian mercenaries, and discovers evidence of the new Metal Gear, only for the franchise's bad penny revolver ocelot to rock up and ruin the party. He does this by basically blowing the tanker up, which pollutes the Hudson with nasty oil. Interestingly, when Snake gets close to Ocelot, he recognises Liquid's personality emerge from the Gunslinger, a bizarre side effect of an operation that saw Liquid's arm being grafted onto Ocelot. Anyway, this new Liquid Ocelot hybrid runs off with the new Metal Gear Ray, and leaves the tanker to become an environmental disaster, which was half the point anyway. You see, the whole affair was a scheme cooked up by the Patriots to give them a legitimate cover for building a facility known as Big Shell, which would officially run the cleanup operation, and unofficially house a giant fortress known as the Arsenal Gear. Fast forward two years to 2009 and we reach the main section of the campaign, which in a shock twist sees a brand new protagonist. Yep, Sons of Liberty sees Solid Snake take a backseat to young hero in progress Raiden. And Raiden is really thrown in the deep end as his first proper gig is to infiltrate the Big Shell facility after a terrorist raid by a group known as the Sons of Liberty sees the president taken hostage. He's aided by the remnants of a Navy SEAL team, one of which calls himself Pliskin, which is a very on-the-nose reference and should immediately tell you this lad's real identity. 
The cat comes out of the bag when Pliskin reveals himself to be Solid Snake in the wake of an imposter Solid Snake making off with a stolen Metal Gear Ray. Despite all of this, Raiden is able to secure the president and for his troubles is let in on a little dirty secret hiding at the core of US democracy, which is that it's all a sham run by the Patriots. The president also spills the beans on the truth behind Big Shell as well, namely its front as the Arsenal gear, which is controlled by an all-powerful AI known as GW. He reveals all of this before detailing the identity of the imposter Solid Snake, who is actually our old clone pal Solidus Snake, who's now heading up a rogue anti-terrorist unit known as Dead Cell. Solidus's game plan is to hijack the Arsenal gear and overthrow the Patriots, and with all these revelations out in the open, the President is promptly murdered by Solidus's right-hand man, Ocelot. And so Raiden's mission becomes stopping Solidus and destroying the Arsenal gear, only things are really not that simple. First things first, there's the tragic story of Emma Emmerich, a computer programmer who helps Raiden to upload a virus into GW, but is ultimately thwarted when she's stabbed by a seemingly immortal member of Dead Cell known as Vamp. Then there's another mysterious cyborg ninja, who it turns out is a Russian mercenary known as Olga, who's actually a Patriot double agent herself and has been forced into helping Raiden in exchange for the safety of her child. That's a lot to take in, but wait, there's more. Along the way, Raiden also discovers that he was actually raised by Solidus as a child soldier, after Solidus murdered his parents, which naturally just prompts Raiden to double down on his mission. And on top of that, Ocelot reveals himself as a Patriot agent, who's just there to make sure the Patriot's ultimate plan comes to fruition, a scheme called the S3 plan, which aims to create an army of perfect soldiers in the image of Solid Snake by replicating the conditions of Shadow Moses. While all of these big story revelations are taking place, Emma's virus actually starts to take a hold within the AI of the Arsenal gear, prompting it to crash into Manhattan. But another little twist comes in the form of a comms call by another AI, which informs Raiden that the S3 plan's purpose is actually to control all human thought from regressing due to all the trivial junk they consume overcoming actual knowledge. And this truth bomb comes with an ultimatum for Raiden. Kill Solidus or Olga's child and Raiden's girlfriend Rose will die. And the twisty turny antics of Sons of Liberty are finally brought to a close with Raiden making good on this ultimatum by killing Solidus, all before an epilogue that sees Solid Snake discovering data about the Patriots' highest council, the Wiseman's Committee, a council of people who it seems have been dead for well over a century. Mysterious. Here we are, the grand finale of the whole saga, Metal Gear Solid 4 Guns of the Patriots, which takes place five years after Sons of Liberty in 2014. Guns of the Patriots is a greatest hits of sorts of the whole franchise, and brings closure to many of the series' long-running narrative strands, some of which date all the way back to Snake Eater. The world has changed since the events of Metal Gear Solid 2 and has seen the rise of a new form of warfare led by a host of private military companies, or PMCs for short. The soldiers fighting within these PMCs have undergone something of an upgrade as well, now enhanced with snazzy new nanomachines that are controlled centrally by the Sons of the Patriots network system. In the mix of all of this is Solid Snake, who despite the five short years since Sons of Liberty has seemingly aged several decades. His old grizzled appearance is the result of the accelerated aging that is a side effect of his cloning, and by the time of Metal Gear Solid 4 he has little more than a year left to live. Oh, and the fox dive virus that's still knocking about in his system since the original Metal Gear Solid has also now mutated, turning Snake into a ticking time bomb of a biological weapon. As he's lamenting on his lifetime of fighting at the gravesides of the boss and Big Boss, Snake is approached by his old friend, Colonel Ray Campbell, who has one last mission for him, terminate his cloned brother Liquid once again, who, as we've already established, is living on in the consciousness of Revolver Ocelot. God damn it, this franchise is bonkers. One key problem standing in his way though is the fact that Liquid Ocelot is basically the ringleader of all the PMCs across the globe, and Snake gets first hand experience of this on the first stop of his world tour to kill his brother, the Middle East. Here he encounters an arms dealer called Drebin, who injects him with the same nano machines that the PMC soldiers are using, which allows Snake to take control of modern technology and fight back. Snake's globetrotting mission to assassinate Liquid takes him from the Middle East to South America and then on to Eastern Europe, all before he returns to the iconic location of the Shadow Moses complex in Alaska. 
En route, he discovers Liquid's ultimate goal to track down the body of Big Boss in a bid to use his superior DNA to hack into the Patriots network system, which will fully give him control over their nanomachine technology. As I said earlier, Guns of the Patriots is a proper greatest hits album of the franchise, and Snake is aided by friends and foes from across the series. Most notably Raiden, who has been transformed into the new cyborg ninja and takes a battering across the adventure. Then there's Eva, the spy that aided Big Boss all the way back in Snake Eater, and she sort of aids Big Boss again in Metal Gear Solid 4 by protecting his body from Liquid's attacks until, well, she's killed by the deranged clone and Big Boss's body is set alight. With the corpse of Big Boss in his possession, Liquid kicks off the endgame of his plan and retreats to Shadow Moses to, well, launch a nuke at the central mainframe of the Patriots network. Snake, Raiden and co hightail over there to stop him, with Raiden losing his arm in the process, and Liquid pulls the rug once again by revealing his base of operations, a new Outer Heaven, which is basically a supercharged arsenal gear like the one seen in Sons of Liberty. Snake boards this new Outer Heaven and foils Liquid's plans by uploading a virus into the core mainframe of the fortress, which brings down the Patriots worldwide network in the process. Only when he confronts his deranged brother, Liquid tells Snake that he wanted to destroy the Patriots anyway, and the pair finally sort all their family troubles out with a good old fight to the death, which Snake naturally wins. As Liquid dies, he briefly turns back into Revolver Ocelot, who has one last moment with his old rival Solid Snake before biting the bullet. And this epic swan song for Solid Snake comes to a close with an extended sequence back at the boss's grave, where Snake, distraught at his lack of purpose in the world, contemplates suicide. He ultimately can't pull the trigger, and it's a good thing too, as there's a few final shock twists in the tale. Chief among them the re-emergence of the actual big boss, along with his old Commander Zero who's in a vegetative state in a wheelchair. Boss reveals that the body being tormented throughout the main campaign was in fact the corpse of Solidus Snake, Boss's perfect clone. Big Boss basically lays everything straight to Snake about the history of the Patriots, and the differing factions that splintered as a result of the opposing ideologies of Boss and his mentor Zero. And his lengthy monologue comes to a close with Boss effectively murdering Zero by turning off his life support. But he has one last revelation for Snake, which is that Snake isn't a pandemic waiting to happen. It turns out that the nanomachines injected into Snake in the Middle East have replaced the fox dye virus running through his system, which means that Snake is basically free to live the rest of his life, or one year of it, without fear of killing anyone he comes into contact with. All except for Big Boss, who succumbs to the fox dye virus there and then, and finally actually dies atop the boss's grave, bringing the iconic saga of Big Boss and Solid Snake to a close. But of course, that's not the end of the Metal Gear franchise, as we have one more entry in the canonical timeline, and that's Metal Gear Rising Revengeance. Taking place four years after the events of Guns of the Patriots, Revengeance continues the story of everyone's favourite tragic hero Raiden, who is now sporting even more snazzy cyborg enhancements as a result of his many, many injuries. Raiden is now working for a PMC called Maverick, doing routine VIP protection, and on an assignment in Africa he's ambushed by a rival PMC known as Desperado, who kills the Prime Minister he's protecting before leaving poor Raiden for dead. And so this sets Raiden on a quest for the titular revengeance against the PMC that left him as a husk of a human. A quest that leads him to uncovering a conspiracy with a US Senator called Stephen Armstrong, who looks like he's entered into politics after a lengthy wrestling career, which I guess isn't too preposterous an idea. Anyway, Raiden does a fair amount of soul searching on his way to revengeance, briefly resorting to his child soldier persona of Jack the Ripper, but ultimately drives forward on his end goal and finally confronts Stephen Armstrong in Pakistan. It's something of an unfair fight though, as Armstrong is piloting a giant new Metal Gear mech known as the Excelsius, which Raiden dispatches with his ninja blade before cutting Armstrong down to size. And there you have it, the Metal Gear Solid timeline explained to the best of my ability. This timeline kind of melted my brain, so I really hope you enjoyed this breakdown. And if you like these kinds of gaming timelines, definitely make sure to subscribe to GameSpot as we've got plenty more on the channel. Thanks a lot for watching guys, I'll see you next time.